Hello, everyone. This is International Master Mark Ginsberg on my new series, Chess.fm, Upholding the Sicilian. In this series, we'll examine how to play the Sicilian against various white attempts. The first session I'd like to do with you is on the smith mora gambit. This gambit is very ambitious. White is trying to attack black and uh, blow him off the board, basically. Uh, Alex Lenderman, Manest on ICC, has done a series of interesting lectures giving you the white perspective. I'd like to give you the black perspective and some philosophy of how I think you can deal with gambits most effectively. I've assembled in my library in ICC under the name Ares, A-R-I-E-S, a number of Mora games that we're going to go over in the first two segments. The first one is number 71 in the Ares library, a very famous game where Ken Smith, the person the smith Moore gambit is partially named after, played Larry Evans, an American Grandmaster, in San Antonio, 1972. Let's take a look. E4, C5, D4, introducing the Mora gambit. Black should accept, as Menest points out in his seminars. C takes D. C3. White could, of course, play knight f3 and uh, get back to normal channels. Black should take d takes c, knight takes c3, and let's take stock. White has given up a center pawn, and if you look at it, the d4 square is going to be very important. Sometimes black can establish a knight there later on. The basic problem for black is that although he's a pawn ahead, his queen bishop is often very difficult to develop. If it advances, if it tries to get out with a later a6 and b5, white can play on the c-file. Black has to be very cautious and play very carefully and respond to white. However, if he's alert, as we're going to see, he can actually even counterattack white's king. Let's see this famous game. Knight c6, logical. Knight f3, that's a standard move. d6, bishop c4. And now, as Manest has told you, the move knight f6 for black is weak due to the standard trick of e5. Therefore, it's correct to play a6, as is well known, and Larry Evans, in fact, played a6. This prepares knight f6 without allowing the e5 trick. Castles for white. In a later segment, we're going to analyze Menest's suggestion, which is e5. This move is interesting, but I don't think it gives very much. We'll look at that later. Smith castled. Evans brought his knight out. And for completeness in this segment, we're going to examine the move e5 for white. But it doesn't give anything. But we'll have to look at it for completeness. In the game, Smith played bishop g5, which is one of the main moves. And this is very instructive what happens now. Evans stops the doubling of the pawn threat by playing e6. Smith plays the gambit line queen e2. And Evans starts to bother the white bishop. This is a very important maneuver. This has been seen in countless games. If the bishop comes back to e3, the knight can continue to bother with knight g4 and then reestablish itself on e5. If the bishop comes back to h4, as in the game, black has a very effective continuation. This, in fact, revolutionized theory of the time, and Smith was so impressed he called the entire thing the Evans defense. g5, bishop g3, knight h5. Rook fd1, white's nominally trying to attack, but in fact, since black has gained the two bishops with this move, he has the uncontested dark squares, and he's going to be able to attack white, an extremely instructive turn of events. g4, that's a very good move, driving the knight off. If the knight went to h4, black could play h5, bishop to e7, and the white knight would be in trouble. Therefore, he went back to e1. Black protects with knight e5. White retreats the bishop. And black immediately plays h5. This move shows you that in certain positions, black doesn't have to play defensively. Let's keep going. This game is a real rout. Knight d3, bishop g7. Black has all the dark squares, and he's up a pawn. He has a better position, and he's up a center pawn. Knight f4, h4. It's already lost for white. He can't stop the decisive line openings to his own king. 
queen d2, hg, fg, and at this point it's completely lost. We'll just go through the rest of the game very quickly. It's a very impressive game by Evans. Queen check, king f1. Already knight f3 would do a lot of damage to white because if knight f3 takes, takes, rook h1 is a big problem. In the game, Evans played bishop d7 first. He's going to have knight f3 anyway. It doesn't really matter. Rook c1, rook, c, rook d8, king e2, knight f3, yes. If white takes the knight, of course, black's going to come down with the rook and win the queen. So he can't take the knight. The position is totally lost. Queen d3, knight check, king d2, winning the other bishop, takes... Queen f2 check. Every move with gain of time. A complete rout. Knight c e2. Bishop b5. A beautiful example of a crossfire of two bishops. White was comprehensively outplayed. He's down material and he's losing more material. Queen e3. And the rest of the game is agony as black simply trades the queens and plays e5. And of course, when the knight moves somewhere, like d5 as in the game, Bishop to h6 check is decisive. That's how the game proceeded. And black had no problems converting this position. I hope this was a nice introductory example for you, a very historical example that's still relevant today. The fact is, this defense is extremely solid and tough to beat. In this segment, we're going to go over some other games in this line and show you some other possibilities. Going back to my library, we have some interesting early divergences, but they don't really cause black any problem. The first divergence we want to look at, we're going to stick with the same defensive posture for black, play with the same moves as Smith Evans. And this time, we're going to try a new move for white. We're going to try putting the bishop out to g5 before castling or queen e2. The purpose being to double black's pawns when the knight arrives on f6. However, this is premature and black gains an advantage. Let's just quickly see why. Black allows white's his idea because it's faulty. White plays this way to double the pawns. But it, it gives black an open g file to operate with his rook, and otherwise it gives him solid control of the e5 square, and it gives black freedom of movement for all his pieces. So it doesn't really cause black any problems at all. The only follow-up I've seen is white playing knight h4 with the idea of maybe queen h5 and with the idea of maybe of knight, h5, knight f5. But it doesn't really work, and let's see why. e6. Logical move, shutting down the white bishop diagonal temporarily. Queen h5, this is a pseudo-aggressive post, but as the computer, in this case I use Ribka, pointed out to me very quickly, I faced this in a tournament game once and it looked scary, but as the computer points out, it's completely nothing. Black plays knight e5, and in fact, he has an even better move. In my game, I played knight e5, and after bishop b3, knight d3 check, I gained advantage after king d2, knight c5. The point being, I'm driving bishop off the diagonal, and then I'm developing, and I was significantly better. But I want to point out that the computer shows me a better move here, which is the fairly easy queen a5. This move, of course, black would love the trade of queens. He's up a pawn, and white can only delay the inevitable by putting the knight in the way as so, and that's white's principal idea, hoping black would mistakenly take the knight, and then, of course, the queen would crash through to f7, and white would win. However, in this position, black, in fact, has a forced win with knight e5. It's very simple. The knight attacks the bishop, on c4, and it defends f7, which was white's whole idea. So white 
White's knight is really now hanging. So the idea totally fails. After bishop b3, for example, black can safely take the knight off, and he's completely winning. This is a very useful variation to keep in mind. Although bishop g5 on move 7 is not seen very much, it's still very useful to know. By the way, that game was game 75 in the Aries library. Now let's look at another divergence, which is played by a, a player on ICC called WTFAI. This is game 76. WTFAI plays into the main line that we've just seen. But where is his divergence? His divergence is coming now. He plays bishop to f4. This doesn't seem to do very much, but it has the point of waiting for black to play the logical bishop g4 and then unpinning with queen to b3, hitting two pawns. And this is a typical blitz weapon that's meant to scare black into panicking somehow. But the computer, again, very cold-bloodedly points out that the idea is insufficient. Black's forced move is fortunately also a good move. The move e6 is actually tactically sound. White cannot take on b7, and this is a very important point. Why can, why can he not take? If queen takes, knight a5, forking the queen and the bishop, white's queen must come back to defend, and now black has, has the move, very strong move, e5. Point being, if white tries to sidestep the impending d5 for black is coming up soon, hitting the queen and the bishop, if he is to sidestep with queen a4 check, he's getting out of the way of the d5 break, black has opened up the defensive possibility of bishop d7, and this move is going to win because the white bishop on f4 is hanging, the white bishop on c4 is hanging, of course, of queen b4, d5, and you have the discovered attack on the queen, and everything is lost for white. We conclude that white cannot take on b7. So in this position, WTFAI, he's a fide master, he plays against me knight g5. He doesn't take on b7, which would be suicide. He plays knight to g5. The idea is some scary-looking sacrifice on e6. But again, it's insufficient. So let's see the right move. b5. That's correct. White plays f3 to try to drive the bishop off. But black has queen b6 check before anything else, exploiting the open diagonals of the king. Rook f2. Knight d4, very strong, hitting the queen. Queen back to d1. And now h6, all very accurate computer moves. White's knight is embarrassed on the rim over here. While various things are hanging, white is a little bit too slow here. Play could proceed fg, hg, bishop to e3, pinning, b takes c, bishop d4, and queen c6. And in this position, black has a really nice game with play against white's split pawns. If white was so greedy as to win a pawn, that would be suicide. After the possible continuation, bishop takes f6, gf, rook f6, bishop g7. Black has a beautiful game with absolute dark square control. Rook f2, rook b8, queen d2, queen c5, rook d1, guard against the bishop d4 threat. Bishop to e5, hitting h2, g3, f6, and I wrote game drawn at the bottom of this game because I drew the WTFAI blitz game, but in this analysis variation, black is way on top. His king is safe. White's king is not safe. Black's bishop is vastly superior to white's knight. So this example variation gives you a comprehensive way to play against WTFAI's early bishop g4 diversions. Isn't this good stuff? Every time we try something for white, black has a convincing answer. Here's another uh, de deviation played against me by Ray Momo on ICC. Same opening moves that we're familiar with, the gambit. Black playing the careful Evans move order. 
And now white lunging with E5, which we'll look at in more detail later. But I want to point out a Ray Momo divergence. He, after D takes E for me, we're going to learn later on that if taking the queen, knight takes, is really nothing at all for white. White can maybe draw, but black's fine. In this game, Ray Momo kept the queens on and played queen E2. This move isn't good, but I needed the computer to tell me the best way to play. Queen c7 is, in fact, the best way to play. In my game, I played knight d4, and after he regained the pawn, although I had shattered his pawns, white was okay with superior development. The computer correctly points out that the better move is queen c7. What I did not understand is after the plausible knight d5, black has a strong follow-up. Knight takes knight, bishop takes knight. Queen d6, hitting the bishop. Rook d1. This looks good for white. But the computer, as always, sees more. And knight d4 is a fantastic move interfering with the d-file. After knight takes knight, black has time to take the bishop. White comes back to f3 to win back one of the pawns. But notice he's down two pawns. That's the problem. So black can safely find a way to offer the trade of queens. Very nice move. The queen trade is offered, and any ending is horrible for white because black has the two bishops and will remain one pawn ahead. White will only win back one pawn after, for example, queen takes queen, a takes b, knight e5, f6, very nice move, creating a center, knight d3, e5, bishop e3, bishop e6. And in this game, black has an extra pawn and the two bishops, and he's completely winning. So hopefully that gives you a sense of another way to play against early white divergences. Let's quickly run through another example. These repetition examples are very good for you to learn various patterns. This was a game played against me by an international master called A. Khrushchev on ICC. Very familiar opening moves. You're used to these. This time he plays A3. A. Khrushchev apparently wants to make a hiding place for his bishop when things get hairy and the bishop gets attacked. I just simply pin the knight, which is the whole idea of the setup. White challenges the bishop. I calmly take it off. Trades help black reach a nice ending. Queen takes, knight e5, queen e2, knight takes c4, queen takes c4. And we see that black is up a pawn, but he has to move kind of carefully because white might be able to come out rather quickly. However, black should be confident because he has no organic weaknesses. E6, F4. This is dubious, but a typical stratagem by white to blast things open. Black just has to be a little bit alert, and he can refute this. Bishop E7, E5, typical stratagem to try to get black out of the shell. Rook c8, a Jewish and Zug attacking the queen. Queen check, knight d7, ed, bishop d6, knight e4. White's pinning everything on a latent pin on the d file, but black can foil it as follows. Bishop e7, rook to d1. White's hoping to keep black's king in the middle, but it's not going to work because black has a nice tactical refutation here. Again, using the open diagonals for the king, we've seen that before. Check, queen b6, check. King h1, queen c6, breaking the pin, offering the trade of queens. The queenless ending will be completely winning for black, of course, because black's up a pawn. White plays queen d4, hitting g7. And if black castles, it looks like the knight is lost, but black saw a little bit further in the splits game and was able to castle because after the ruinous queen takes knight, rook fd8, and unfortunately, if queen takes queen, we can see that rook takes d1 is check, and after the king moves, then rook on c8 takes c6, and black will be up material. Therefore, white had to go for the unsound continuation. Queen takes d8, rook takes d8, rook takes, bishop takes, knight c3, bishop f6, bishop e3, h5, and white is completely lost. This game gave you an illustration of how black carried out his principal idea, which is simply bishop to g4 and simplify. It also showed you that black has to be alert as white tries 
a certain attacking stratagem, black has to react in the most convincing way. My advice is when you try out these defenses as black against your friends or an ICC, check them if possible with a computer program like Crafty, Fritz, or Ribka, and see what the computer thinks of your interpretation of how you should defend. In every case, in every position we've seen, black had plenty of resources, but of course, if he's not careful, he might fall into a landmine. So these various games are showing you various attacks and how to defend. For completeness, we should show you what happens if white tries the early e5 on move 8. Follow the main line, the Evans defense. Here, e5. This is a move later than Manest recommends. Manest recommends white move e5 on move 7. We're going to consider that continuation in our second segment. That's a very important move. Black has plenty of resources, but it is a critical continuation that we're going to reserve for the second segment. In this segment, I want to show you on move 8 that it's not entirely harmless, but black can defend. Here's what black should do. He should take the pawn, of course. White take, trades the queen. We just saw queen e2 not work in the Ray Momo diversions. Knight takes d8. Of course, not king takes d8 because you don't want the f7 pawn to hang. So knight takes d8. Knight takes e5. And now the computer likes the move knight to g4 because the more pieces go off the board, the better black's chances in the ending. White's trying to attack black's king in this queenless middle game, but black has enough defenders. So knight g4. White, of course, avoids the trade of knight f3, asking black, what is your knight in f6 doing out there? Bishop to e6, logical, opposing the bishops. Again, white avoids trade, hoping to exploit black's awkward-looking pieces. Knight c6, returning to a nice square. Rook d1, a standard Mora move. g6. And at this point, interestingly, the computer spots a draw, which is kind of funny. Black's up a pawn, and it looks like he should win, but white has a continuation that may just draw. So in retrospect, g6 might not be the greatest move. But I want to show you the draw because it's very funny. Knight g5 hitting the bishop. Bishop f5 avoiding the shattering of the pawns. g5 threatening, of course. Knight c7 check winning the rook. Black defense with rook c8, which is logical. Now, if white were to play the blunder bishop to f4, of course, black would play e5, and he would just be winning. White instead plays h3, knight back to f6, and at this point, if knight takes knight check, ef, black would just be up a pawn with good winning chances. Instead, white plays knight to b6, and it's pretty funny because if rook to d8, that would be a blunder because Basically, white can take off the rook and give black a bad game. So black should play rook to c7, and then, then there's this incredible move, knight to a8. And again, if rook to d7 blunder, white takes the rook off, and it turns out if a piece, one of these pieces takes on d7, knight to c7 check is happening, and then the f7 pawn is going to fall. So therefore, black should not play rook to d7. He should play rook back to c8. And then the white knight evidently comes back to b6, and we have a really bizarre repetition draw. A very funny pendulum, knight b6 to a8, rook c8, c7, c7, c8, c8. Isn't that funny? This variation resulted in a draw by repetition, which is really unlikely when it started. So if we were to go back, there's plenty of room for exploration here. Black's at least equal. But at this point, I would search for improvements for black because I don't believe it should be a forced draw. But after g6, the computer seemed to indicate a draw, which is kind of humorous. The last divergence I want to do in this sec segment is a game played against me by Lev Millman quite a while ago, which is my game 74 in my library. 
And this is another one of those early divergences that doesn't really cause any problems. Familiar opening moves. Bishop e3 divergence. Similar to the WTFAI divergence where he played bishop f4, this move also has the idea of tempting black to pin the knight, as I did. And then white comes out and unpins, threatens f7 and b7. I unpin. And at this point, in fact, white could consider taking on b7. And after a continuation such as knight a5, queen back, for example, knight takes, bishop, queen takes, bishop f3, queen c6 check, knight d7, gf. After this kind of continuation, black would be perfectly happy since he's castling next. However, with the reduced material, it's probable white can hold it. So with these things in mind, it's playable for white. Let's go back to actually how the game went. He didn't want this kind of static position. After e6 on move 9, he went for bishop b6 to keep pieces on to try to win by attack. Queen b8, getting out of the way. Knight d2, just like in the WTFAI game we just saw, white is trying to leave the black bishop out in a, in a void. The idea is clever, but black has defensive resources as follows. Knight, bishop e7 h3, trying to chase the bishop down. Bishop has to go back to h5. f4, white's trying to um, pawn storm black and trap the poor bishop out here on h5. However, black has a resource. It is knight to d7, very strong move. If the bishop were to go back somewhere, of course, b5 and black's gaining space. However, what's stopping white from playing as he did g4. It looks like black's bishop is lost. But it's not true. After bishop to g6, f5, the alert viewer will realize that all I need to do here is play knight takes bishop, queen takes knight, d5. And this shocking move opens up the critical line from b8 to g3 causing destruction in White's camp. That's what I needed to do. Instead, in, a blitz, in this blitz game, I was so excited by that idea, I implemented it wrong, and I played d5 right away. This mistake allowed White the possibility of counter-sacrificing with knight d5, because now the queen on b3 eyes the g3 square, and I don't have a check anymore, and now the game is completely unclear. Fortunately for me, in a moment of carelessness, Milman grabbed the pawn ED, after which his own king is dead, after the obvious queen g3 check, and now it's resignable. The game ended quickly with black hunting down the white king. These moves don't even need comment, it's so gruesome. h5, trying to open up the h-file for mate. g5, desperately trying to keep the h-file closed. I keep picking off things with check. This is 95 check. White's king is now running into the middle of the board. When the king's up here, you know something's gone wrong in a gambit. EF. White can't take the knight because of mate. And after these few moves, mercifully, White's king was mated by a pawn. The purpose of this game is to show you that when white launches a pawn storm early, black has to seek his chances in the middle. You always counterattack in the middle when faced with a wing pawn storm. That's a rule that you should never forget. And it was true in this game too. I didn't implement it correctly, but at least you get the basic idea. So to recap our first session, what we've seen is a comprehensive way to play against the Mora involving Smith's classic debacle against Evans dating way back to San Antonio 1972. To show you one final example, also back in 72, Smith had to face Grandmaster Enrique Mecking from Brazil. Enrique Mecking was a world championship candidate and a 2600 player, and as you could guess, 
he played very solidly and was able to defeat Smith very convincingly, but without Evans' um, fancy attacking schemes. He just played positionally and let Evans go crazy. Evans, uh, sorry, Smith plays A3, which is um, we've seen that before in the A Khrushchev game. Mecking chose to play E6 and not pin the knight. Pinning the knight is perfectly good, but E6 is solid. Queen E2, a Mora move. H6, Mecking doesn't want White's bishop to come to G5. Rook D1, a typical Mora move. And Mecking sees nothing wrong with E5, which donates the D5 square for White, but it gains control over other squares for him. So he's going to say to White, you know, do whatever you can. I don't see what you're doing. Knight d5, an immediate occupation is not bad. Black, this is a very instructive moment. Black played bishop e7. He doesn't mind losing the two bishops in this way. Why? Because soon he'll have bishop to e6, totally defending all the sensitive squares and remaining with an extra pawn. White has the nominal advantage of the two bishops, but black has a very solid pawn chain, and his remaining bishop is on the right color. Let's go back to the way the game went. Evan Smith didn't want to take on e7. He played bishop e3, focusing on the b6 hole. But Mecking at this point eliminated the annoying knight. Knight takes d5, ed, knight b8. And here he has a Sveshnikov type formation. His idea is to castle, of course. He's going to try castling. He's going to try playing f5 in some positions. He's going to play knight d7 in some positions. He has to watch out for the knight takes e5 trick after he's castled and playing f5. He doesn't want the long diagonal open up at the wrong moment. But in this position, all was a moot because Smith went crazy right away with knight takes e5. Probably it suffered so many reverses with the gambit, he was just sick of the whole tournament and just decided to Harry Curie here because this move makes no sense whatsoever. When you're playing a grandmaster, the last thing you want to do is an unsound attack because the first thing the Grandmaster knows how to do is to win and retain material. Just take the knight, f4. You can see by inspection how desperate Smith's play is. Simply take the pawn, why not? d6. All these moves, they optically look good, but in fact, they don't make any sense because Mecking can just keep taking, and Smith must have been playing for some kind of e-file um, pressure or something like that, but it's all an illusion. Mecking simply defends e7 with knight c6, and after Smith intensifies pressure on e7, hoping for castles, bishop takes knight, pawn takes bishop, d takes e, winning, Mecking in fact did castle, and after Smith went ahead with his plan, bishop takes knight, Mecking simply came out with the bishop to g5, this Schwissenzug, and after White's queen moves somewhere, of course, the bishop on c6 is falling, and that's the end of the game. Smith did, in fact, resign here, which um, was very sad, and he must have just had enough of all this uh, accurate play against his gambit. Also, interestingly, in this tournament, he arrived at his games in top coat and tails, and he made a very fancy impression but his chess moves were not commensurate with his outfit. And a final note to the session, when I was researching these Mecking and Evan games, I looked on um, in Chess Base's big database, and in the famous uh, Smith-Evans game, which I will show you, just, just bring that back on the screen here, it's my uh, library entry 72. When I looked up this game on the database, Usually I see Larry Evans' name as Larry M. Evans because there's an international master called Larry D. Evans. And it was funny to me that this database had M spelled out. And Larry Evans' middle name, I don't know if you know it, but now I do, it's Melvin, M-E-L-V-Y-N, Larry Melvin Evans. I don't know. I found that kind of funny. So that's the last, um, that's the last bit I wanted to share with you in this session. And this, so we have... Smith Mora, part one. I'm going to end it here. And in part two, we're going to go over Manest's, Alex Lenderman's recommendations that he gives in his uh, chess.fm videos. 
and how I feel black should play. In every case, black has perfectly adequate resources, but we have to tread carefully as always. So I'd like to leave you with a recommendation. Try my lines against your friends in blitz or tournament games. Try to look at them with other friends or with a computer. And please message me, Aries, A-R-I-E-S, on ICC, with your findings. And on my blog site, if you finger Aries, you'll see my blog. I'm going to dedicate a section to the Mora, and hopefully we'll get a lot of nice interaction going. Also in the second session, I'm going to share with you an interesting draw I played against National Master Mark Esserman from Florida. That was a very interesting topical game, too. So we'll do Manest lines, Alex Lunderman lines, and we'll do a Mark Esserman game. So thank you very much. This is International Master Mark Ginsburg signing off in Morris session number one.